Good evening. Good evening. Glad you are here. This is an exciting evening because we're talking about a book that everyone wants to talk about. So this is. I just want to critique your interpretation. This is an exciting evening. It's an important evening for us to think well about God's word, and so. We three, as your pastors, are hope filled to be able to do that <laughs> in a way that makes uh, sense, in a way that uh, makes things more clear and able to understand. Understanding God's word is incredibly important because it speaks to our lives. And uh, the book of Revelation certainly does that. All right? So Chad is with us tonight. He uh, was busy last week, but he is here. And so he's going to get us started off right. Open us up with some scripture and prayer and let's go. Awesome. Awesome. Man, I'm so excited to get to be with you guys. Uh, As you probably know, you even start using the word revelation or the end or the end times and you start to get a lot of people's fears and nervousness and anxiety up. And so tonight we hope that as we walk through this, this chapter, uh, literally an overview of the book, that it gives you some peace. Uh, because there's a lot of things that are very clear in the book. There's some things that are muddy as well. Um, but as we get started, let's open, open up uh, with a word of prayer and ask the Lord to open our hearts and the Spirit to speak to us. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And Lord, there are parts of it that we know exactly what you meant for us to hear. And there's other things, Lord, that we're still trying to figure it out. And we pray that you would enlighten our hearts, God. Give us your spirit, Lord, to speak to us as we look at your words. We pray, God, that we would be encouraged. God, this book has encouraged your church for 2,000 years. Help it to encourage us tonight, Father. We love you. Be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So there's a lot to think about uh, as you think about the book of of Revelation. It goes in lots and lots of different areas. A lot of it's full of imagery. and, uh, And as you think about that imagery, there's a lot of different ways to interpret it. So as we run through this at a 30,000 foot pace tonight, please understand we're not gonna try to nail down all the specifics. We're gonna breeze over some things. So you're probably not gonna get all of your questions answered, but we're gonna do our best to give you a good idea how to, how to, how to think about the book uh, in general, okay? I, I wanna start by reading a couple of verses out of Matthew 24. Uh, Jesus spoke about the day of the Lord in the end, and he says this, uh, if, you start, if you look with me, um, starting in, in verse 11, Matthew 24, verse 11, it says, um, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But whoever stands firm to the end will be saved. And then he says this, And this gospel of the kingdom we preach to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. All right, so just kind of in the back of your mind, just think that the Lord himself spoke about what these things meant. And he talked about standing firm, and he talked about the mission of God to get the gospel to all the nations. And those two things kind of form the core of what the book of Revelation is talking about. And so as we get started tonight, think about um, those things. We'll see them in the letters. We'll see it as we go through, uh, all the way through. You'll see those things kind of revisited over and over again. Um, But I want you to know that historically, Revelation has been a mess. All through history, there's been a lot of argument on what this means and doesn't mean. For instance, in the 5th century when Rome fell, the entire Orthodox side of Christianity decided that Revelation must have been false teaching because Jesus didn't come back after Rome fell. They were so certain that Rome was Babylon that when Rome was sacked and Jesus didn't return, they thought this must be rubbish. They didn't touch it again for 1,100 years. It wasn't until the 16th century that they started using the book of Revelation again in their teaching. And it's just one example of how volatile this book has been and different interpretations of it have been throughout history. Many different people at many different times have thought they were living in the end and they were certain of it. Probably none more than the World War II era folks. They saw the world coming to an end before their eyes and they knew that the end was near. And yet here we are, approaching 100 years after the end of that war and wondering, what's next? And of course, in our own generation, the volatility around us, what are we asking? Is this the time? And all we can say for certain is we're closer than we were yesterday, right? (laughs) And so as we get going, there's a lot of of overview. There's a lot of numbers. The numbers 7 and 3 and 12, they all mean complete. 
and fullness. So when you see those things, you shouldn't think about them literally as in seven days. It means the fullness. It's all of them. The seven churches is the whole church. The 12 tribes is the whole tribe. All of the nation. I'm just running through this, Jason. No, no, no. <laughs> Three, seven, and twelve. They're in your notes. But if it helps you to remember by writing it, you write away. You just keep on writing. So there's also so many symbols. There's horns, there's animals, there's dragons, there's all these things. So as we run through this tonight, think about those things, keep it in mind. And, uh, and so now Daniel's going to talk through some key terms. There's a, a lot of terms that cause confusion. And uh, so Daniel, why don't you to walk us through this next section? I had this job last week too. I'm beginning to see a pattern here. But um, <laughs> so some of the terms that maybe what you came hoping we would spend the majority of our time talking about, we are, I need to go ahead and tell you, I'm going to cover these quickly, all right, just to get them out of the way. But this is not going to be where we focus tonight because our intent is really not not to get into particular views on some of these terms that you have here, right? We'll go ahead and talk about them and define them, but we can understand what God is doing in the book of Revelation and what it is we need to understand, even if we have some differences of opinion on some of these terms that you have here. But some of those terms that, you're, that you think of when you think of the book of Revelation, one of those is the millennium. So what do we mean when we talk about the millennium? It refers to the thousand year reign of Christ. Okay, so Revelation Revelation chapter 20 uh, is where we primarily would look to see that. Some theologians will, will say that is a literal thousand year reign that's inaugurated upon Christ's return. So it is a physical reign that he will come and do. Others see it symbolically, okay, that it is the time period between Christ's ascension after his crucifixion and resurrection, and then the time that he will return in judgment. They say that thousand years is a figurative thing that just represents that period of time between his, his coming. Okay, um, his ascension and his return. So that is when we talk about the millennium, that is that is just so you know, those are two of the primary views that the church have held of what we're talking about there. The word rapture. Okay, that is another big word when we think of Revelation. This word rapture, that means to be caught up or taken away. Remember last week we talked about there is dispensationalists that just see these different periods in history and how God deals with different groups between Israel and the church. We saw that that is one way that people view scripture. Well, within that group, there is, there is the idea of the rapture, which they would base that out of First Thessalonians. Uh, that says there's going to be a period of time where the church is caught up and taken out of the world. That's what they mean by the rapture. Okay, there are other views that understand that reference in 1 Thessalonians to actually be Christ's second coming when he steps back down. So there's two different views there, but both can, can be held and still understand what's going on here in Revelation. Tribulation is another big word that we would use here, right? Um, this time of intense persecution preceding the end of things. Again, some would see this very literally, that it is a literal seven year period of time where these things happen. Um, others would see it much more symbolically, that it just represents that time of suffering and persecution and, and, and kind of those pains in, on the earth before Christ's return. So when we speak of the tribulation, that's where you also, it's attached with the rapture that will the church be raptured out before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, after the tribulation, all those things would be tied to, to that understanding, but those are all wrapped up there. And then the final term that you may hear tonight that we might talk about is this idea of an archetype, right? It's just a, a picture that when you see it, uh, it represents something. So we've given you a couple of examples there. When you see a lion, it represents power, right? When you, when you hear the sea talked about, it represents chaos, right? Um, so, so those are just some of those terms that get used. But, but really tonight, we want to not get caught up in, in well, wh where are you? What do you believe about this? What do you believe about the rapture? What do you believe about the millennium? Those kinds of things. Really what we want to press into is to say, yeah, those things may May, you may look at those and you may place them in different places in Revelation based on how you interpret those words and what they mean. 
but they don't have to affect the big picture of what God is doing here and what our, our big understanding needs to be. So I wanted to get that out of the way before we jump in and just kind of hit the ground running. Awesome. Awesome. So when you start looking at the book, you have the, the very first chapters, this introduction of the person speaking to John in this vision. And then it immediately goes into these seven letters to the seven churches of Asia. Now, all of those churches are fairly close to each other in today's modern Turkey. And, uh, and, and in that kind of space, you can think about all these early churches in the first century that John was related to. John was living in Ephesus at the time that he was exiled uh, to Patmos. Patmos is just about a, a one and a half hour boat ride from Ephesus, so it was still fairly close. And so he's thinking about these seven churches. That's the, the people who he's, he, he's authored and sent this letter to, these letters to. But again, if you think about the word seven, the seven means that this is to the church, right? It's to all churches. And in fact, I think as we go through this, I think every church in history on a smaller scale or a larger scale can identify with one or more of these seven churches. And so when you look at them, I've given you a chart. It's on your second page. The chart kind of highlights the, almost the, um, the methodology that John used to address the church. There's some very simple things. Each letter starts with an introduction to Jesus, who he is, what he looks like. He looks different to each church. It's a little bit of a difference. Then there's an indictment, things that they probably should do better. And it's followed by a commendation, the things that they're doing well. And then there's a rebuke. Like if you look at the Ephesus church, it's the rebuke is that you have left your first love. That's a terrible thing for the Lord to say to a church, right? Um, you go on down to the encouragement where he says, remember from where you've fallen, repent. Do the things that you did at first, right? There's this, this encouragement. You can return from the depths, right? The ultimatum is repent or the church will be removed from its place. And ultimately a promise that I will give to eat from the tree of life, right? There's this, so each one of these churches has these different components in the letters. And so as you look through the letters, I've given you the chart because I want you to notice a couple of things. First off, there's two churches that don't have an indictment and don't have a rebuke. And if you look at those two churches, one is Smyrna and the other one is, is uh, Philadelphia. Both of them are poor. They're persecuted. They're struggling. And in both of them, they have a beautiful commendation. But when you look at that, nobody wants to be these churches. The other four churches have more. They're more they have strength, but they have false teaching inside of them. Some of them, again, have first, lost their first love. They're very religious. They're doing all the right things and none of the, none of the right heart. It's a big problem in that, that, or that Ephesus church. And then, of course, the Laodicean church, the one that's compared to America all the time, is the one that has everything. They think they're rich. They think they have all. But actually, it says you're poor, wretched, blind, and naked, right? Buy from us. Buy from me things that are worth, worth good things. that will. And so you, you see these churches. Well, I want you just to boil it down to a couple things. Um, there's four major issues that plague the five churches that are rebuked. Uh, one of them has the religion problem. They're doing all the right things, but with the wrong heart. So they've lost their first love. I don't know if you know anybody like that, if you know any churches like that. Maybe you've been around church for a while. It's not uncommon to see people, we joke about legalism, right? People that have all the right rules and yet oftentimes miss the grace and love and heart of Christ. Um, so that, that religion can be such a problem. Uh, the second one is there's false teaching. Two of the churches are struggling with, one's the Nicolaitans, the other one's struggling with this, it says the Jezebel that is among them. Some, some false teaching that is, is driving the church. <clears throat> and it's, it says that you've done really good things, but you haven't separated yourself from this false teaching. <clears throat> it's very interesting. The church is responsible to know when they're being taught bad things. While that leader, the teacher, will be held accountable, the people are held accountable for believing false teaching, guys. That's on you and me. Like, it's one of the things about us being priesthood of believers is that we have a responsibility to know and decipher the truth. That means you have to know God's Word. You have to be attentive to His Spirit. You have to know how to respond. So that was the second one. The third one, the Laodicean church, it's prosperity. They have so much, they think that they're blessed, and when in fact... Their blessing is only in their pockets. It's not in their hearts. And so this encouragement to return. And of course, the other two, the struggle that is not really outside, it's this persecution. The church is being punished from without. And they are struggling to believe if God really cares about them. And again, you get to the heart and the core of what this book is about. It's to encourage the church that's going through hardship. 
And there's nothing more encouraging than knowing that God is in charge of all of this. And that's why these clear pictures of how Jesus loves and he's constant and he's present and he's available and he's bigger than life in this book. And it's one of the reasons that Revelation is added to the canon uh, and the arguments around what goes in Scripture. It was, this was a picture of Christ unlike anything else in the New Testament. And so as you go through there, I want you to know, I, I boiled it down to the very bottom. There's lastly, the conclusion of these letters is a call to faithfulness for the church, all seven of them, but the whole church. It's be faithful to Christ and his teachings and be fruitful as ambassadors to the lost world. Those are the two things that are boiled down. It's the same things that Jesus said. Remember from Matthew 24? It's the same things. To, to, to be faithful to him and to continue to make the gospel available to those around you. And so that sets up kind of the keys. As we go through the rest of this, those are the big, the big barriers. And then now we're going to kind of uh, guardrails is the right words. And then now as we start going through the middle and we look at all of this imagery, keep those two things in mind. Be faithful and be fruitful. Uh, those are the things that you should have uh, as you read through this book. Yeah, amen. Amen. Be faithful and be fruitful because the Spirit of God is with you. And this is, this is His church. So um, we're probably pretty familiar with the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. Most pastors are courageous enough to preach through those first three chapters, and then they usually punt after that because things get a little different. And, oh, and at that point... Uh, you enter into the entire book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature, but the, uh, the symbolism, am I still on? There we go. Sorry, my thing fell out of my pocket. Uh, the, the, the symbolism and the uh, apocalyptic nature ramps up quite a bit after that. So chapter four opens and John is, he's no longer exiled on Patmos. He has been uh, taken into the heavens, and there is a heavenly throne room. I'm actually preaching about this. This is the second vision of Jesus uh, that we're looking at this Sunday. And so you'll get a lot of those details. Uh, but G John is ushered into the heavenly throne room. And all of chapter 4 is a description of that throne room um, that sets up. Uh, the, the whole thing is the magnificence of God. But chapter 4 is, is like the description of what's on a, a, a play, like what, uh, what the entire scenery is. And then chapter 5 is the actual action. Uh, because in chapter 5, uh, uh, we are introduced that in God's right hand is a scroll that is sealed with seven, uh, with seven seals. Now that scroll represents... God's plan of redemption through the rest of history. I'll detail for the, the, a little more on Sunday, but John is removed from the scene. Uh, God is holy. God is separate. He is other. And there is a large sea that separates John from everything that he sees in chapter 4. Okay? Um, it's, it's part of the fall and sinfulness of man. That scroll represents, is God going to redeem this place? Is God going to just keep it a mess? Or is there, gonna, is there a plan of redemption? God's enemies are running around and they are causing all sorts of destruction. Is God going to judge them? God has people, but they're being persecuted. They're going through all sorts of peril. Is God going to save them? Is he going to protect them? Is there any hope for God's people? That is all that is represented in that scroll. And the charge goes out, who is able to open the scroll? And none is found worthy. And then coming from within the throne itself comes the lion from the tribe of Judah. And John turns and looks, and it is the lamb that is slain. That's our picture on Sunday, okay? A little teaser. That's where we're going. And then the lamb, I mean, all, all the, the entire heavenly scene bursts into worship. Then the lamb begins to open the scrolls. The scroll, right? Just one scroll. Begins to break the seals and open the scroll. Now, we need to pause here, and we need to ask the question... 
Uh, this, this is a, a major way that you're going to have to piece the book together. There are going to be seven seals that are broken, followed by seven trumpets that are blown, followed by seven bowls that are poured out. And those are bowls of wrath. Okay? Now, there is, there's debate on everything in the book of Revelation. I'm trying to give you really solid, uh, overwhelming convention on most of this stuff. But you can always find people that are going to argue with everything that you say about the book of Revelation. Okay? That said, there is a chart that's here. Okay? And what I want to show you is um, most scholars agree that the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls are a recycling of the same destructive events. In the Western world, we think very chronological. We're like, well, it's the seals, and then it's the trumpets, and then it's the bowls. But this is apocalyptic literature, okay? And so what I want you to see is that the seals are broken, and then we relook at the judgment and outpouring in the trumpets, and then you relook at that in the bowls. And I say this because when you get to the sixth seal, that Daniel's going to cover in just a second, right? Christ comes back. The sky splits apart and Christ comes back and he brings judgment. And they are hiding in the caves from the wrath of the Lamb, okay? So, the other thing I want you to see, different people disagree on a timeline, is that this unfolding of judgment by each breaking trumpet in each bowl is an unfolding of judgment, that that occurs throughout uh, the, the entire age from, uh, from Christ's ascension all the way until the end. Go to the next slide. The one other thing I want you to see is that there is a progression with the seals, trumpets, and bowls, and that is when you read the seals, they're broken and a fourth of a plague comes upon, it comes upon a fourth of the land. Famine breaks out and a fourth of the people die, all right? But then when you get into the trumpets, and those are Egyptian plagues, the, the effect of it is now a third. And then by the time to the bowls, it is the full wrath of God that is coming. So the two things I want you to see, this is a recycling, but I also want you to see that there, uh, this seems to indicate that things are going to get worse and worse all the way until the end. There are going to be wars, there are going to be famines, there are going to be plagues, but as we get closer to the end, the intensity of those things increases. You will see the signs, you will become aware of these signs, that that seems to be what is indicated by the seals, the trumpets, and the bolts. All right, so as we go through this, Jason has talked about those first, right? Those first four seals, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? We've got war, we've got conquest, we've got famine, we've got death. You could look in Zechariah chapter one to see this imagery that is also there in the Old Testament from Zechariah's prophecy. And then in the fifth seal, you've got the martyrs and their voices that are going up to the Lord, asking and crying out that question of how long, O Lord, before you come and judge the wickedness in the world. These are those who have been faithful and they have lost their life because of their faithfulness to Christ and their cries are going up to the Lord. And then we get to what Jason mentioned just a minute ago, this sixth seal. And as it is broken, the imagery in Revelation chapter six, when you read that, it is intense at the end of the chapter. It says the kings in verse 15 of the earth and the great ones, the generals, the rich, the powerful, everyone, slaves and free. What do they do when this sixth seal is broken? It says they run and they hide in the caves and they beg the rocks to fall down on them to hide them from the judgment of, of God that is coming to be poured out on all of those who have rebelled against the Lord. So you just see this very intense and scary scene that just shakes you to your core. And in the middle of that, we have a break in chapter seven, and that is very intentional. It's almost like a, Chad called it a commercial break, right? Uh, it's like, we're gonna interrupt this intense scene to just let you catch your breath, 
okay? And you need to turn your gaze from all of this destruction and the wrath of God that is being poured out on the rebellion of the world that have turned their back on him. And we want you to pause for a minute and we want you to understand something. In chapter seven, it talks about those who have been sealed. Right? You may have a heading in your Bible that says the 144,000 of Israel that were sealed. Now, if you were here last week, do you think this is talking about those who can trace their bloodline back to the Jewish race? Or do you think this is talking about the true Israel, those who believe and place their faith in God? Who is the Israel that has been sealed in chapter 7? It's true Israel. So that was very helpful when we connect last week to what we're seeing here. But I want you to look at what it says here. It talks about all of these have been sealed by God. Those who are faithful to Christ, they are, they are secure. They are sealed. And it says in verse 9, John says, I looked and behold a great multitude. Right, one that no one could count, a number from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and the Lamb. Right in the margin of your Bible or in your notes, Genesis 17, verse 14. Go back and look it up and it takes you all the way back to God's promise to Abraham that from his seed, this very thing that we see here, the sealing of those who are in Christ. Again, this 12,000 times 12,000, this fullness, all of those who are in Christ are sealed and secure, right? So even in the midst of seeing this wrath and chaos, we get to pause and lift our heads and remember the security, right? That we are sealed, we belong to him. And then the picture gets even more beautiful as John looks and it says he looks up and he sees the throne and he worships God and he sees all of those who were worshiping God falling at his feet and he's, his mind is reset, right? He, he gets that perspective, that heavenly perspective that God is on the throne even when the world is falling apart and the people of the world are crying out, let the rocks fall on me. It says God is still on his throne and his people are sealed in him. So it's incredible news that we get right here in the middle of, of these, between the sixth and the seventh seal that we get to see here. Important movement there. Sure, and if you're not sure of who they are, yeah, like right there, the, the one of the elders asked <clears throat> in verse 13, who are these in the white robes? He asked me, and I answered, sir, you know, and he said, they are the ones who've come up out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. Like It's a beautiful picture that people from every tribe, tongue, language on the earth, all of them are represented before God's throne. It's a, it's, a, it's a fulfillment of the Great Commission, folks. It's the same language that Jesus said, go therefore make disciples of all the language tribes. It's the nations, ethne, it's right there. It's such a beautiful picture. Revelation 7, 9 is one of those, those things that drives us out in mission. Um, well, we're talking about Revelation. We'll stop. Okay, so go, when we talk about this idea... It, it drives us in mission because we know what is accomplished, right? We know where we're headed. Yeah, right? right? If you know the final score of the game, it, it, you can be a little more motivated in, in the middle of the game, right? It, you, you can relax just a little bit and you can be courageous to keep going. It's such a powerful thing as the church struggles and it's attacked and it struggles with everything from false teaching to persecution they can look forward and say, there is a God on the throne and he's bigger than everything we see. And this idea, if 12 is the fullness of the apostles, is the fullness of Israel, what's better than 12 times 12 or 12,000 times 12,000? The wholeness of God's people is reflected in front of his throne in this picture. And it's a beautiful picture. And, uh, and they're told, hold on, it's not quite time yet. But what, what I want you to see is, again, some one of the major focuses, archetypes, as you go through this, uh, is this idea of this contrast. It's a battle between good and evil, right? So as we see God's people sealed, 12,000 times 12,000, we also see in chapter 13, Satan seals his own people. He gives them a number. Does anybody know what the number is? 666. And he marks them. Have you guys ever been heard about this idea, the mark of the beast? That's another thing we probably should have defined. Right? People get nervous. What if I get marked and I don't know it? You know, is that going to mean I don't get to go to heaven? You guys ever had those questions? 
Yeah. The story here is that God marks his people and no one can unmark them. In fact, it says they won't even be injured or touched. That God has sealed them for that particular moment. And it's a beautiful picture because as you look at this, this other idea of Satan's seal, he seals them um, and, and, and makes them, it's very clear, they reject over and over as these punishments come on them. The Bible is so clear to say that, and they reject him and curse his name. Like, if they have a moment where they could turn to the God that's, that has called out to them and sought them and made them and, and loves them, and instead, when this moment of desperation, they hate him for what he's doing. And so the, the seal of Satan, the 666, uh, you can dig, dig down into it. It really is the name of Nero, the the, uh, the, the Caesar of the time when, Paul, when John writes this. Um, but it has a lot of different pictures. In the end, God's people are sealed for God's purposes. Satan's people are sealed for his, his purposes. And it's a very clear depiction of who's on God's side and who's not. And I, I included a quick aside in here because, guys, I've been asked this question many times, uh, especially uh, with COVID. I was specifically asked... Is the COVID shot the mark of the beast? And if I get it, am I now marked? Okay, so let me set your fears aside, okay? And that is that everyone in the book is marked, okay? If you do not have the Holy Spirit of God, you are marked as the beast. He owns you. Right? But if you have been saved with Christ, and this is what Daniel's going to dig down into next week, the way that the New Testament talks about the sealing of the Holy Spirit, you are his. Okay? You are his. And you cannot lose that. You cannot accidentally get the mark of the beast. It's not a computer chip on your credit card or any of that stuff. Do not be fearful of those things. Okay? You... You're already sealed, right? This, the, the book should comfort you in the fact that, you, do you know whose you are? He, he is my father. I am his own, okay? So we, we wanted to look at, at, at the seals uh, and show you that as that judgment is unfolding, there's this interlude and, and it picks our head up, that commercial break, and you, you feel encouraged that, oh my goodness, look at what God is doing while all this judgment is coming. Look at what God is doing, okay? Now, that is the way that the book unfolds. It gets more complicated. <laughs> Confession. I chose the first part because it's a little easier to show you that, but I'm just letting you know that, that those interludes and the scene changes, they interject because in the midst of the unfolding of the, of the uh, seals and the trumpets and the bowls, you have these interludes that are meant to describe or encourage activity towards the believer. Okay, that's the way the book unfolds. Now, so we looked at the seals, that both Satan seals and God seals. Next, I want you to see in one of those uh, interludes, um, uh, chapters 12 through 14, it gets really scary in that section, okay? Um, and what you have in, in our 30,000 foot view of what's happening in the book of Revelation, um, what you have is Satan always rises up with a counterfeit. You have the Trinity unfolded in the book of Revelation. Okay, The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the seven spirits that are before the throne of God that go out into all the earth. You have the Trinity working throughout the book of Revelation for good and for redemption. And then you have Satan who is introduced in chapter 12 as the dragon, okay? And so the dragon appears in chapter 12, and he is the serpent of old, who's called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And then we're taken to imagery that's very scary and very apocalyptic, and that is we have two beasts that rise up in chapter 13. Now, 
You can read a lot of people that will tell you a lot of things about these beasts and throughout history and who who the heads have represented and a lot of that stuff because heads uh, are defined as representing kings or kingdoms as it goes through, okay? And, and you can have a lot of people that will tell you who it is or who it's going to be and ways that we can twist names around to equal 666 and all sorts of stuff like that. But re regardless of the details, what I want you to understand is the way the book is working. So the dragon has, a, there's, there's a second beast, or sorry, there's a first beast that rises up out of the sea. And what you are supposed to know is that this beast is the anti-Christ, the opposite of Christ. As you can read there in 13.2, the dragon gave all of his power and his throne and authority to this first beast that comes up out of the sea. And I saw one of his heads was is as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed. Now, what, who does that sound like? This is not a trick question. Who does that sound like? Jesus, Jesus right? It sounds like Christ. Okay, But the beast is able to perform this death and resurrection. Okay, Then... Uh, a second beast is followed up, and this is the beast that is formed out of the earth. And you can read those passages there. But what you should notice, the function of the second beast is uh, to make all who dwell upon the earth to worship the first beast. He, the, the second beast is a spotlight ministry for the first beast. Who does that sound like? The Holy Spirit, right? Um, and and performs great signs and fire came down? What does that sound like? Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, okay? And because of signs. So you have Satan who is now functioning in, in, in very uh, picturesque, apocalyptic imagery. And the purpose here is that there is God's uh, trinity and then there is the anti-trinity that functions and wars against each other, okay? Again, uh, as Chad said, the, the entire book is this movement of good versus evil and seeing the way that that unfolds, okay? So you have the trinity and the anti-trinity. Flip your page. So as you work through the middle sections of the book, that is what, at a 30 foot thousand level, what I want you to see is the unfolding of the seals, the trumpets and the bowls, as well as this, uh, uh, as this good that Christ is doing and then the antithesis that Satan is doing. The way that those rise up and the way that those are, are pictured throughout the book. Then you begin to, uh, in the final uh, act of the book, you move toward what we call the final uh, resolution, chapters 17 through 22. Okay, where twice in a row the kingdoms of the earth are pictured with two different images. Okay, and the first of those images is a harlot. Okay, a woman who is uh, so uh, th this woman who is unfaithful. So the harlot is the kingdoms of the earth personified as an unfaithful woman, okay? And she commits all sorts of immorality with the kings of the earth. She's clothed in purple and scarlet. That is riches. It's the lures and pleasures of the earth, okay? She is called, in verse five, she's called Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, okay? So think of this imagery because it's, it's done here on purpose and the application, once you, uh, once you understand the imagery, you'll understand that the application is for all of us. She is all that is seductive and luring about the pleasures of the world. The pleasures of the world from the perspective that they lead you away from God. That they replace God. Right? She is that seductive woman. Harlotry. Being unfaithful. 
faithful to the one who has created you, to uh, your husband, your lover, right? That's the picture there. So in verse five, she's called Babylon, literally Babylon the Great. That is who the woman is, okay? Uh, But uh, in verse nine of chapter 17, she sits on seven hills. Now, seven hills is undoubtedly in the first century meant Rome, okay? Uh, The city on seven hills. So to the original audience, there is... Uh, zero doubt what it means that this woman sits on seven hills means. So she's called Babylon, she's called Rome. Also, in, uh, in verse eight, you can see that she sits on a beast. Now the description of this beast, although the, the beast is called scarlet here, the description and the terminology matches the beast that is out of the sea in chapter 13. Okay, uh, the one that had the fatal wound and was healed. All right, so again, you're given details about kings and heads and how many, have, how many kings have come and how many still are, okay? And, and you can read into those details about those kings, but what I want you to understand is the purpose of the image there of that woman is to talk about the kingdoms of the earth that cycle throughout history, Rome and Babylon and others that rise up throughout history and represent the seductive lure away from God towards materialism, towards the pleasures of, for you to be unfaithful to your God. That is who the woman is. And she is set in contrast to the bride of Christ. Okay, so you you have these dual images. The harlot, but then you have the bride of Christ. In Revelation chapter 19, we're given this magnificent picture of the bride of Christ at the end. At the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the bride, what does every bride do for her wedding? She prepares herself. And on that day, she wants to look absolutely perfect, without blemish. She goes to painstaking detail to make herself look as beautiful as she possibly can for her groom. And that's the picture of Revelation 19. Now, who's the bride of Christ? Oh, yeah, it's, it's the faithful remnant, right, that we talked about last week. That's, that's us. It's those who are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Like, we see that, and we get really excited about, you, you have two, uh, two women. Uh, which one are you? Are you part of the harlot tree, or are you the bride of Christ? Okay, see the way that works? All right, so another picture, right, of the same, same thing that Jason is talking about. We see this picture, right, of, of the harlot and the bride, but we also see it uh, described, Babylon is also described as a city, right? It is Babylon the Great, and it is set in contrast with the new Jerusalem. And so as we look at this, we are seeing that Babylon, this great city, represents civilizations throughout history, just like the harlot did, where they have rejected, they have rebelled, they have turned their back on the king, on the true king. And they are chasing after exalting themselves in material things and sin and wickedness. And they have placed themselves on that throne to, and said, we reject God's authority and his reign. And we, are, we want that ourselves. They said that is a repeated pattern throughout history that we see. And that is always likened to this city of Babylon the Great. And so in this picture, as we get to chapters 18, and then we would move on into chapters 21. You see it some in chapter 19. You see it in chapter 22. This picture of of the new Jerusalem set in contrast. Here is the best that the world has to offer in Babylon. But here is the new Jerusalem, the city of God. 
And I want to call your attention and give you some homework. Go back and read Revelation chapter 18, because there you see the fall of Babylon the Great. You see that the kingdoms of this world cannot stand, right? They, the, their corruption, they will ultimately destroy themselves, right? And they will not stand, right? That God's plans and his purposes will succeed. Right. And he will establish a new kingdom. But when you read chapter 18, you should come away from that chapter with a heaviness and a mournfulness. You should mourn. John, John leads us to mourn the fall of Babylon. Why is that? Because when we see the beast and the dragons thrown into the lake of fire, it is like do a happy dance. Right. Like we're meant to celebrate that. But when Babylon falls, there's a sadness, there's, there's a somberness to it, right? It is right and it is good for us when we look at humanity and we see humanity being destroyed by the seductive powers of sin, right? That draw that ultimately the things that they think will give them life ultimately lead them to a hopelessness and a despair and a destruction. It is good for us to look at that and, and be sorrowful, right? To mourn the devastating effects of sin. And that is exactly what we're to do when we see this, that ultimately the kingdoms of the world, they will perish because of their sin and their rejection of the Savior. But you've got a chart here that shows you, here is, what, here is the best that Babylon has to offer, but it falls so short of the glory of what awaits those who will be with God forever in the new city, the new Jerusalem, where he is on the throne, right? Where he fills it with light and goodness and, and all of the things that people tried to chase after. It's like, no, he is the fulfillment of all of those things. And so this is an important movement in in the storyline that we are looking at here to understand what is going on and how we're meant to view these different comparisons, the harlot, the bride, the city, Babylon, the great, but God's city, the new Jerusalem, right? It continues to point us to, to one thing, right? The thing that we've been talking about here, that Christ is, is the ultimate fulfillment. He is the one who is victorious, right? All the kingdoms of the world will not stand, right? And we weep over that. We mourn, right, over those who reject because they are missing out, right? Just like, just like we mourn when we see the brokenness of sin in our own lives and we see it in our loved ones, right? It's right for us to mourn that because it causes us to long for that day when he will wipe away every tear, when he will, when he will heal every disease, right? We, we long for that, but it's also good for us to see it because in the here and now, it helps us to remain faithful. Like Chad was saying, the message to these seven churches, remain faithful during this time until Christ returns. When we see sin for what it is, and we can see beyond its lure and its enticement and its entrapment that it promises something that it can't deliver, right? It causes us to recognize it and remain faithful to Christ and reject these pulls of the world that want to lead our hearts astray into things that ultimately just cause more brokenness and pain. So it's good as we read these things to have our perspective calibrated to keep our eyes on Christ. And, and that's, that's the moment we find ourselves in today. And what I mean by that is, is Babylon exists today. It's the world that is constantly pulling us. It's trying to capture your heart. It, it's trying, the, the temptations, the vices, the perversions, the excesses must be resisted by the followers of the land. It's, it's something that every church throughout history has had to fight with. And, and every believer has to, to seek first the kingdom, right? We, all of these verses that we think about how God challenges us, uh, Matthew 24, those who stand firm to the end will be saved. These verses all pull the heart of the believer to put your faith and hope in Christ because everything else may fail. 
Babylon exists today. And, and, and there's a sadness when we see it capturing the hearts of those around us. But there comes a moment here in Revelation where the sadness ends. And that sadness ending is, again, one of the pictures that you have to take away from this book. Because there comes a point when the age of grace comes to an end and those who have punished God's people for so many years finally get what they deserve. And while that sounds really harsh in this moment, in this space where we live today, it gives hope to those who have been crushed by Babylon. You know, there's churches today that are feeling like they're in the midst of Armageddon. There's churches, you know, there's a, one of the oldest Christian populations in the world is in Gaza. Did you know that? There are churches there that claim that they were started by Christ and his disciples, and they've existed there since that time, underneath many Muslim regimes. And, and there's 800 or so that are inside churches hiding from the Israeli bombardment. Some of them have been killed by the bombardment. Some of them have been killed by Hamas. There's all kinds of struggles in that place. But do you know they must feel like they're in the midst of Armageddon today? But the hope is that they know that there's a God on the throne that knows their suffering. He's there with them. They're not alone in the midst of it. And that's one small community among thousands of those communities in world history. There have been times in many churches' struggles where they wonder if God remembers them. And this is one of the places you go to for courage. Listen to this in verse 19. After all of their suffering and the, the lament over the Babylon's fall. Look at this in verse 19. Uh, this is what it says. The great multitude in heaven. Who was the multitude? The ones before God's throne, chapter 7. They say, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For just and true are his, judge, are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the elders and the four living creatures, they bow down and they worship God who is seated on the throne. And they cried out, Amen! Hallelujah! And it just keeps on going. This worship service is completely about the destruction of Babylon. Just and true are your ways, O God. There's a moment where God is going to stand up for his own. And in this age of grace, and we can pray that it lasts for a millennia longer, the opportunity remains for those to call on him and repent. And there's a, there's a brief window here where even the, the, the trials and tribulations cause the nations to, to cry out and repent. It's a very short window. But there's a window where some come to him, and then that window closes. And then this is what happens here. They, they leave, the, the Babylonian people, this, this group that loves Babylon, they lost everything. They saw all their hope cast away. It's destroyed. And do they turn to God and repent? No. They're furious. And the, the beast and the prophet and the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth, they gather them all together. The, the river Euphrates is dried up, and they're ready to fight against God. And they think they have a chance. Has anyone read the end? There's not even a battle. Basically, the sword that comes out of the mouth, the word of the king, undoes them. The, the dragon is captured and destroyed, the beast and his prophets and all that are with him. And just like that, the battle's over. There's no like triage and there's no like, um, it's not like what's happening in Ukraine and Russia right now, who's going to last, who's outlasting the other. This is a one-sided battle from the beginning. It's not even close. And again, the picture is, is John wants the church to know that he who is in charge, he that we love, he that loves us, is bigger. I mean, by far. It's not even a competition. The Caesars that are causing the death, the Neros that have killed Peter and Paul, the Diocletian and Domitian that are coming later that wreak havoc on the church, they're nothing compared to Christ. Amen. And that encourages us. When we look at the news today and we wonder, does God care? Is he close? Yes. And he always has been. And that is the picture. And so the, the, rest, the rest of the book is that, the quick resolution, right? The king comes. The enemies are destroyed. There's, there's only justice. There's no mercy. Only justice. And the, the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, they're defeated and all that are on, on their side are destroyed. The followers of the Lamb are vindicated and given peace and rest. Chapter 20 talks about the, th the thousand year reign 
They're, they live for this thousand years with peace. This picture that, that John is putting in your heart and mind is there will be such a time of peace that almost the bad stuff will be totally forgotten. If you live at peace for a thousand years, who remembers the other part? Right? It's such a big and beautiful, lengthy picture. And there's some people that have given us some great pictures. If you ever read Pilgrim's Progress and John Bunyan, like you watch the pilgrims tra- travel and difficulty through the journey. When he finally gets to the celestial city, it's just like, all that other stuff was just a joke, right? It's momentary suffering for an eternal, beautiful future. Such a beautiful picture. So you keep seeing all this. There's such a beautiful thing. Uh, it says that Satan is released for a short time to deceive, and then he is cooped up for eternity, never to be seen again. And God's people reign with him. And there's these beautiful, beautiful verses. And, and really where we're going to end tonight. I told you right at the beginning that this, this concept, those who stand firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel that came to be preached, the testament of all nations, and then the end will come. That be faithful and be fruitful. Those pictures kind of stay with us all through the book of Revelation. And when you get to the very end, turn with me to the last few verses, chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. And I don't think you get a better picture. We're finally here. The wedding feast is occurring. The powerful pictures of the culmination of God's plan to redeem his creation. All things are made new. The bridegroom receives his reward, a bride without spot, without blemish, and a redeemed humanity as God's created image to rule alongside that groom for eternity. You have incredible pictures, gemstones the size of of, uh, of, of doors. You can't move them, pearls that are gates. And uh, the, the, the measurements are insane, you know. A, a thousand miles high, a thousand miles deep, and a thousand miles wide, kind of like the new city. It doesn't fit on this earth, so there better be a bigger earth if it's going to have a city those size. Like, uh, John's wanting to just blow your mind. Can you imagine what this glass that is, uh, or gold that is so pure it's like glass? Has anybody seen gold that looks like glass? I haven't. Maybe someone will dig it up one day. I don't know what that looks like, but it must be pretty nice. All of those things, these images, just to make you think about how grand and amazing and marvelous this day with the Lord is going to be. And so here we are arriving at 22, 1 through 5. And it says, The angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the great street of the city, on either side of the river stood a tree of life, stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Again, all God's people gathered there, all of them together. All nations, tribes, tongues, languages from chapter 7. Now they're here, their their nation is healed. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Listen, there is no greater picture of the coming, redeeming day of the Lord than what we find in this book. With all the fear that it causes when people open it, they're like, oh man, I don't know. I hope I don't live in those days. I hope I don't have to see all this tribulation and t- terrible stuff and hailstones and blood and all the cra- And there is a lot of crazy images. But all of it is to make this picture crystal clear. That God knows. And he's near. And he's bigger than all of the problems that the church will ever face. And so if we are faithful to him, and we're fruitful in our love and care and lives, then one day we'll reign with him. That's the picture. That's the end. That's the end of the story. And so... Man, we could, we could spend probably a year or more if we wanted to go through this verse by verse. And it could be a real mess because we're going to give you the best that we can imagine. But what we've shared with you tonight is kind of the easy stuff. This is the stuff that's fairly clear. This is the stuff that, that you can say with some confidence, um, this is pretty, pretty easy. And so I hope that it gives you confidence. I hope when you look at the news, you see what's happening in Israel. and You see, there's coming a day. That's for certain. Is it this year, next year, 2033, the 2,000-year anniversary of the church? People are talking about that a lot right now. I don't know. But I do know that he will be with us until that day. Amen. Amen. Why don't we pray as we close?
Anything else you guys want to add? And next week we will um, we're going to drill down into some of these images that we've kind of just brushed over tonight, looking at at just what is ours in Christ. So we're going to look at what it means to be sealed, right? What it means that we're the bride of Christ, right? What this new city, right? The place that scripture says we are citizens of a new city, right? We're going to see those things because as we see how scripture constantly points us to those things and shows us the richness of that, of what is ours in the gospel, it gives us hope in the journey along the way. So that's how we want to conclude this three-part study that we've done. As we look ahead, we're going to come away saying there is nothing to fear because I know who I am and I know whose I am. So that's how we're going to wrap it up next week. So hope you come back for that one. In your handout, you'll notice there's charts we didn't reference. Those are just for you, right? If you want to go back as you read and study, if you want to do some more digging into Revelation, some of those we thought would be helpful just to give you some ways to compare, um, to point you back to places it's referenced in the Old Testament. So that's what that handout is. Yeah. So many people have talked about the book of Revelation like it's uh, impregnated with meaning, like every line is taken from Scripture. Like sometimes within a verse you might find two or three references, one from Daniel, one from Ezekiel, one from Matthew. And, and John is pulling from so much of the Old Testament and New Testament to make this, this thing come alive. And so those first century readers that knew the content, they knew the Old Testament, they knew the New Testament, they could hear all those voices as they're reading through this. This is from Moses, and this is from Isaiah, and this is from Ezekiel, and this is from Jesus, this is from Paul. They can hear all of that as they read through it, and it really is a phenomenal and unbelievable piece of literature by itself. But again, the hope that it gives the church is unlike anything else we have. We hope that this is enjoyable for you. Let's, uh, let's pray as we close. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this book. God, we thank you for the hope that it gives us, Father. We thank you for the warnings that it gives us as well. God, it's so easy for us to rest in all that we have. God, or the things that we think we do so well. It's so easy for us to rest in our work. And yet, Father, we know most of all you want us to rest in your love for us. God, you are enough. And our service is nothing but worship to you. We don't earn your love. We just respond to it. We pray, God, that you would be honored in the way that we love you. We pray, God, that our faith would be increased. That, Father, when we suffer, when we go through hard things, that God will trust that it's not in vain. And God will remember that you went through this same difficulty. And, God, you are right there with us. You are the God who draws near to us. You are the God who is with us. So, Father, we thank you. We pray that you would give our world hope that they would turn to you while they still have time. That God, so many who are far from you would, would feel and know that you're calling them to you. That God, they would respond. God, we pray for your workers, your people, God, your sealed ones throughout the world. Some of them are suffering today. We pray, God, that you would remind them that you're with them. That God, they wouldn't suffer in vain. And God, we pray that you would use us, that we'd be found faithful and fruitful in the time that you give us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.